Hi, my name is Gavin Kleesmies. I'm the Executive Director of the Cambridge Historical Society, and I'm happy to welcome you here today. Um, before we get started, I just want to do a, a couple quick thank yous. Um, first, I'd like to thank the library, who's been very gracious in hosting two programs for us. Uh, the, this program was actually originally planned to be at the Lincoln Institute, uh, but we had more people signed up than we could fit. Um, and it's a shame that we weren't able to be at the Lincoln Institute for Land Policy, uh, but at least we're in this room, which is uh, quite a beautiful room as well. So I'd like to very much uh, appreciate the library for, for making this available. Um, I would also like to thank our co-sponsoring institutions, which include the Lincoln Institute, MIT, and Livable Streets. Um, and I would particularly like to thank our underwriters, which made all of this financially possible, uh, primarily Irving House and also Forest City. Um, I would also like to say that this whole project has been a great learning process for all of us. I personally was not actually alive during the battle about the inner belt, so it's been a, a learning experience for me. Um, and this was really made possible by having a really great committee that worked on the project uh, that included Carolyn Crockett, uh, Richard Garver, Michael Kenny, Alyssa Pacey, and Jim Peters. And so I would like to thank all of them for, for their help. Um, and before we, we move on, I would also like to say that the Cambridge Historical Society is an independent nonprofit organization. We are not supported by any tax money. Uh, we are also not a part of a larger institution, so we uh, survive entirely through membership support. So you'll find that in your program there is a membership form. I would highly encourage all of you to join the Historical Society. Um, if you don't want to join, those forms also work great for donations. So that's, uh, you can mail them in that way. Um, and I'd also just like to say that uh, our next large event is our Spring Benefit, which is one of our largest fundraising events. Uh, this is about the history of innovation in Cambridge. Uh, it's being hosted by the Broad Institute in Kendall Square, uh, and will feature speakers from Zipcar, E-Ink, Breathe Breathable Foods, uh, and a quick review of the history of innovation at Cambridge. So it's on May 20th at the Broad Institute, so if you're interested, please check out our website. There's also a flyer in your program talk talking to you about that. So, uh, before we get started, we're going to have a quick uh, statement from Livable Streets. <laughs> My bad reputation for speaking precedes me. So, on behalf of Livable Streets Alliance, again, I want to welcome you all here. We're going to hear some of the legacy of the fight, and I was old enough, and my house is one of the houses that would have been taken, and I remember it well. It was how I first came to Boston and got involved in Boston politics. But tonight we're going to talk about what came out of it. And it's particularly appropriate because Livable Streets Alliance sees itself, ourselves, as carrying forward those same themes of protecting communities, trying to expand the breadth of the, the modes of transportation so it's not only about cars, and moving forward towards a livable future. So again, we welcome you, and I think uh, this is going to be as good as everything that's come before it, in which case that's a pretty high standard to reach. Welcome you all. And our host for this evening will be Richard Garver, who is a recently retired uh, uh, <laughs> just, just <laughs> deputy director uh, for transportation and infrastructure for the Boston Redevelopment Authority. Uh, he, he also lives in a house in Brookline that was in the path of the inner belt, so he has a lot of personal feelings about the, the stories as well. So without further ado, here is Richard Garver. Good evening. Um, let me just take a moment to talk about where we've been in these marvelous sessions that preceded this one. In the first one, we heard about how in the 60s and, and early 70s, public policy was driven by massive federal funding programs and the mandates of them, and there was very little cognizance of neighborhoods in those programs. There was also not a built-in recognition that the opinions of the affected uh, neighbors, particularly the working class and the poor, mattered and should be taken cognizance of, and uh, there weren't the organizations to represent them in place. In the second session, we heard from some of the individuals that rose to the challenge, um, and my takeaway was that they were motivated intensely by the, a deep feeling for the neighborhoods that they were in. And as one of them said, um, they understood their neighborhoods even before Jane Jacobs wrote about what made them great. They had the proximity um, that brought them together. They had the mix of uses that allowed them to live their lives fully within their own communities. 
and make them friends with each other through constant contact. Um, so they proceeded with a great deal of conviction and not a great deal of understanding of what they were getting into. In this session, we're going to hear about what came of it. We're going to hear first about how the public policy directors of the time responded. Then we're going to hear how planning in this interbelt corridor has proceeded since then, and then uh, try to touch on finally um, how infrastructure planning is carried out today, to what extent it reflects the lessons of the interbelt. We're going to hear from three distinguished panelists here. Uh, Jack Wofford, I'm going to give him a fuller introduction in a moment, Suzanne Rasmussen from the City of Cambridge, and Anthony Flint from the Lincoln Institute. Uh, we're going to have, try to have time for questions and get you home for the second period of Game 7. Uh, Jack Wofford uh, is a professional mediator and facilitator who lives and works in Cambridgeport. And when he was a uh, a lecturer at Harvard Law School, he was selected by Governor Sargent to uh, lead Sargent's task force on transportation. And when the recommendations of the task force were accepted by the governor, he was asked to direct the restudy of the transportation system, which is fondly known these days as BTPR, the Boston Transportation Planning Review. You'll be hearing more about it. Um, he's had several state and federal positions, uh, mostly related to transportation. Many of you might have seen him in action uh, when he was asked to be the facilitator for um, the revision of Scheme Z, which turned into the Zakem Bridge. So let me introduce Jack. Um, I was really privileged to and, and honored to uh, become the director of the Boston Transportation Planning Review, a three-year restudy of controversial expressways and transit lines that was ordered by Governor Frank Sargent. Um, I was not the director of the Governor's Task Force on Transportation. Alan Altschuler was the chair, and uh, I was work sitting in uh, Langdell Hall at Harvard Law School directing uh, uh, law students in some paid research and teaching a, a seminar. They were looking at things like, uh, well, could we crack open the Highway Trust Fund and use it for transit? What are the parkland protections? How should transit be funded? I mean, they picked some non-controversial issues. <laughs> and uh, you'll hear that those, some of those were relevant later on. So there I was uh, when I was uh, asked by Alan if I would uh, be his executive director. He and I had been working together on some uh, transportation issues, he then at MIT. So in 1968, some of you may either remember or have read in the history books that there was an election, that Vietnam was very important to it, that the Democratic Party was riven apart, and that Richard Nixon became president. He um, enticed Governor John Volpe to leave the governorship of Massachusetts and uh, become the Secretary of Transportation. Volpe, before being governor, had been the Commissioner of Public Works. That left his lieutenant governor to become the governor, and his name was Francis W. Sargent, Frank Sargent. So, he, Frank Sargent, uh, took the oath and did the traditional walk down the stairs at the State House, and this is what greeted him at the bottom. <laughs> this was literally right after he was sworn in. And you will see it is a protest over both highways and uh, uh, Logan Airport expansion. And he greeted the folks, and some of you will probably pick out various people there. You can certainly see that there is a mix of people of all races, uh, uh, ladies with fur hats and pearls, and uh, uh, various others that reflected the very mixed nature of the people who were protesting this plan. And um, this really is what was at stake, and 
uh, I call it sort of the harmony of the spheres that had been dreamt up in the 1948 highway plan. If you imagine Route 495 way out here, and then you have Route 128, uh, and you have these spokes coming in, uh, 95 as of January of 69 was partly under construction. It was mainly a, a uh, elevated embankment. Uh, 95 North had not been built. The southeast, of course, existed. The turnpike existed. Route 2 existed into Alewife. So the plan was to continue Route 2 from Alewife into the center uh, to construct a new Southwest Expressway from the point where I-95 North coming up from Providence ends uh, and have them all connected by an inner belt that would then connect with the central artery. So um, that was the very symmetrical and beautiful plan that uh, was at issue. I would say as a matter of background that Alan Altshuler, who had been a professor of political science at, at Cornell before coming to MIT, had himself written a book on citizen participation. I myself, after clerking for a federal district judge, had been a staff assistant helping to set up the Community Action Program, which had its, its philosophy, maximum feasible participation of the poor in designing, evaluating, running their own programs. I think that those backgrounds came into play. Um, what happened with the governor is that it took him a number of months to decide what to do about these protests. In May he gave, of that year, he gave a speech to Urban America <coughs> promising to appoint a task force. In August, he appointed Alan Altshuler as the chair, and Alan asked me to be executive director, and it was a blue ribbon task force meeting confidentially, privately, on Saturday mornings. We began in October. By the last week of December, um, we were wrapping up our first phase, which was how to deal with these controversies. The second phase was going to be how to structure the secretary's office. We went into, we wrote a report and reported to the governor in, um, in December of 1969, the last week. By total coincidence, that was also the, la the week that the United States Congress enacted the National Environmental Policy Act, called NEPA. We were recommending pretty much exactly what NEPA was about to require every state to follow in tapping federal transportation money. Uh, any major federal action needed to be the subject of an environmental impact statement. You will see that we actually in the BTPR produced the first draft environmental impact study in the country under NEPA, and uh, we were very much a fishbowl as people came from all over to see what this was all about. So, um, I'm pressing the wrong button. This is the response of people to the harmony of the spheres. This is the proposed interchange where the inner belt uh, would join with the south uh, West Expressway and take off into the South End Bypass, which happened to be another expressway heading in inside the inner belt into Boston. And this is what the land looked like at that time, and I will simply uh, ask you to note that in the middle of it is a park. And uh, uh, the Department of Transportation Act, Section 4F, I'm putting my lawyer's hat on for the moment, uh, required that no federal transportation facility could go through a public park or historic place unless there was a determination that there was no feasible and prudent alternative to that alignment. We'll come back to that. This is uh, represents the philosophy of the time of balanced transportation. It shows the beautiful Southwest Expressway uh, with the beautiful orange line in the middle so that you had a balance between transit and highways. They were both right there in the same corridor. 
And this was, is uh, 95 coming up from Providence as it ended at Route 128. And in the distance is the Fowl Meadow. And these are the start of the Blue Hills. And uh, it was going to be very easy because the highway would simply go across this nice flat area next to the Amtrak corridor. Uh, as you probably know, things didn't turn out that simply. And um, I'm going to come back to that. But just remember that interchange, Section 4F, and um, the parkland issues. So we reported to the governor, and it took him till February to decide to impose a moratorium on highway construction and planning. And he called up his uh, former boss, um, Mr. Secretary, um, I want to take the $6 million study that um, was to be uh, allocated to a joint development design study through Central Square Cambridge and use half the money and do a two to three year restudy of the need for all these facilities. I would like to have heard that conversation. I did not um, because Governor former Governor Volpe and now Secretary Volpe knew every detail of every plan and he was a strong advocate of it. Frank Sargent had been an associate commissioner, but he had been commissioner of natural resources before he became lieutenant governor. So we have an environmentalist um, in the governor's chair. I will tell you one story that those of you in the South End might be interested in. There was this, we, again, the lawyer in me suggested to the task force, well, maybe at the start of our sessions, should we hear from the opponents? Yeah, that's a pretty good idea. And then the next meeting, well, why don't we have then DPW come in and defend its plans, you know, tell us what's in their mind. So we got the harmony of the spheres and the, this blue ribbon group of about 10, 12 people were saying, you know, well, won't there be some congestion and where are the rooms? And tell us about the South End Bypass. Oh, well, that's, you know, heading in. Well, what's going to happen to all the traffic when it gets to the end of the South End Bypass? And I don't know whether it was I or somebody else who asked the leading question and said, well, if you have all these things coming inside the inner belt, maybe you need like a big rotary at the center. The chief engineer, you know, of DPW said, yeah, actually, that would be really good, but we can't figure out how to sort of surround the common with this big rotary at the end. <laughs> so, you know, the delegation left, and I can, you know, violate confidentiality to say that one of the business leaders who was on the task force said, <coughs> Oh my God, it is worse than anybody ever expected. So the task force was really looking at this with, with um, fresh eyes and uh, recommended to the governor that there be a moratorium, that there be this three-year restudy, and the governor, uh, there were, you see this, this is po politics, I'm doing politics, process, and policy. There were a lot of internal issues within the administration. Al Kramer, his chief of staff, um, had been uh, with the Mass Law Reform Institute, a uh, progressive Democrat who was in there, and he had issues with other parts of the administration. The upshot was the governor went on um, statewide TV and radio and announced there's a moratorium, we're going to have a three-year restudy. Um, and I think we're going to hear a little excerpt from that in uh, the next segment here. So um, we could cut the slides at this point. I will say that about oh, maybe early December when the task force was getting its mind together, we really need to recommend a moratorium. That's a big step. And we had a person who was liaison with administration and finance, and he said, well, you know, by the way, this $6 million contract to do joint development design work is waiting for its last signature in A&F. And it's expected, we met on Saturdays, to be 
put on there the early part of next week. Whoa, so a, another oh my god issue of like the bureaucracy is moving on its own timetable. And it got stopped and that gave, you know, every crisis is an opportunity, so aha, six million dollars, let's say we can go and do the restudy for about half that. Um, I just want to say that at the bottom of the page, the legal setting was that the environmentalists, after the local veto was uh, repealed, so Cambridge couldn't stop this on its own, the environmentalists were do their, doing their own holding action. The Robbins case uh, came down in 69, dealt with the foul meadow. They said that there was not a specific enough legislative uh, effort to statute to indicate that there was a real intent to go through the parkland. And then, lo and behold, in March of 1971, a unanimous Supreme Court uh, interpreted for the first time Section 4F in uh, Citizens to Preserve Overton Park against um, the Federal Highway. And it really took a very general federal statute and did what to me is classic Supreme Court interpretation and application. And it said, well, it says no feasible and prudent alternative. Does that mean that they'll just say they looked at all the options and it's most feasible and prudent to go through there? They, they literally, the court wrote, nobody lives in parks, nobody votes from parks. The Congress must have had something else in mind, special protections for parkland or this statute is meaningful. And I've quoted Thurgood Marshall's language here for you to have, but you know, they took a general statute and added a uh, standard to it of paramount importance, uh, s special impacts, all of these things. So there we were trying to get a re-study going. And um, the first step was, well, should we just invite a consultant in to, um, um, well, let me, let me show the slides on what we did about Section 4F, which came about, you know, a few months before the restudy was to begin with. The staff discovered that there was an aquifer under that nice flat railroad uh, alignment, um, and we called it the Big Dipper uh, internally. Um, you know, sometimes graphics are very powerful. This was one we used over and over. And as a result, um, your BTPR director had to go in front of uh, the uh, 1,300 screaming people in Dedham and in Revere and say, in response to their question, why are you looking at a highway alternative that goes through our back doors? We thought it was going through the Foul Meadow or the Lynn Woods at the other end of 95 or the Fenway in the center. And well, I'd say, well, the United Supreme Court of the United States is, yeah, right, you know, the boos and the screams. Uh, they could not understand that this actually was the new federal law. So I would just like to leave you with a thought that a statute like that can have pretty major significance and it, we took it very seriously. The essential elements of the restudy I've outlined there are really key to understand. It was advisory to the governor as a decision maker. It was an open process to look at all options with full environmental, economic, transportation impacts, with wide community and municipal impact. Cities and towns were to be taken very seriously. It was to be supported by a multidisciplinary team of professionals drawn from around the country, engineers, architects, transit and highway experts, demand analysts, ecologists, planners, air, water experts, and even a lawyer, not me. Um, headed by a project manager, he was head of the consultant team, and I was the state's neutral director. Uh, neutral is important to realize. I purposely uh, kept myself from 
deciding what I favored or didn't favor in the interest of an open and fair process. And um, we also had deadlines that we had to um, observe. So the first question was, well, what would be the scope of this restudy? And um, uh, some of us, you know, there was some instinct to say, well, let's get um, the former Federal Highway Administrator, who's now a consultant, and his team to come up, and they can look at the controversies, draft a scope, and, and we can go from there. And, you know, my experience in the Community Action Program and such said, well, maybe we should get the stakeholders involved in actually dis advising on what the scope of this study should be. The previous studies had had such bad credibility, I thought it, it might be a way to um, establish credibility and make a better study. So this is the group that met in MIT in the summer of 1970 to design the study. You'll see some familiar faces, including Norm Faramelli on the right, who was here at the first session. I don't know if Norm is here today or not. Um, this then is the successor to the steering group that suggested that the uh, the scope of the restudy that the 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 steering group met, uh, oh, either once a week or every two weeks. And you'll see some familiar faces there. Uh, Herbert Meyer from the Environmental Coalition. Uh, Kathy Stein, who was uh, in the community liaison staff. Uh, the reporter who's not quite asleep, Abe Plotkin. Uh, these were open meetings and our uh, traffic and Transportation Assistant Manager for the City of Cambridge, Sue Clippenter. Um, oh. <laughs> I'm moving on quickly. <laughs> I can shut this off. <laughs> Sue here? No. <laughs> um, so, let's just focus, and I'd like to really, this is a big part of what I want to leave you with the functions of that steering committee, the steering group. It designed the scope on an advisory basis. It was composed of about a third state agencies, about a third cities and towns, and about a third from the non-governmental groups of all shades of opinion, the Chamber of Commerce, the Highway Builders, the Transit Coalition, the Environmentalists, they were all around this table. They created a subgroup to advise on the choice of consultants. There was unanimity among both the agency people and the non-agency people. They reviewed new options as we went along. They looked at budget priorities. They reviewed criteria for, because criteria were very important to measure the uh, options. There was no comparative weighting on the assumption that people had their own value structure. We needed to display the actual facts, not to try to say, well, an environmental impact is worth 50 and a transportation impact is worth 75 or whatever. They reviewed the detailed models, appointed some people who were technical. Steve Kaiser, I think, is here and uh, might have been involved in some of that as a citizen. Um, we analyzed every alternative that made it through the first filter to an equal level of detail. So it was apples and apples. It wasn't this big engineered highway plan and these little new ideas. If there was a serious new idea, they were going to get engineering detail uh, attached to them. In the end, they uh, were concerned about the drafting of these draft reports and said, well, could we create an editing committee? Oh my gosh, you know, that's, it's net, you know, you're gonna be too slow, we have debt. No, we're gonna work really fast, so an editing committee of eight people was selected, and uh, this afternoon in my cellar, I dug out one of the uh, corridor reports. There was one of these for uh, colored orange for the Southwest corridor, colored red for Cambridge uh, and uh, Alewife Transit Extension. This happens to be the North Shore one. And I am convinced you can see the detail of engineering with uh, uh, clover 
brief designs and such. I'm convinced that that editing committee looked at virtually every page of this and that the comments never were um, uh, disagreed with. There was consensus all the way. I will say that that steering committee for three years of the restudy had complete unanimous consensus on every process issue that they had to deal with. And they dealt with all of the big issues. So my respect for the people around that table is enormous. They were all there to work hard. The restudy was not going to recommend one or the other of these options. It was going to display choices. And that was the whole mission of giving the governor choices. We ended with regional formal public hearings where people could express their opinions. A record was made. It was sent to the governor. There was a summary. Um, so we went from the informal neighborhood workshops, steering group, many, 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 many evening meetings. Um, and um, in the governor then received these and needed to make his decision. And so what was his position in the, finally I shed my neutrality when I was invited to first brief his staff and then um, come into his office with about six or eight of us, Alan Altshuler and the head of our consultant team and uh, others. And, um, you know, I expressed that I thought we'd given him options that he could choose among. Uh, if he chose the highway option or even the managed expressway, which was an option for the Southwest, um, it was defensible, but probably he would have to defend it maybe for six, eight, ten years of litigation. On the other hand, if he wanted to engage the energies of some of us to continue on this, why, what about going with the other options uh, and uh, try to change federal law, uh, which then restricted gas tax revenues to highways and uh, maybe have a constitutional amendment in Massachusetts that would open up the state gas tax to transit. And you know, his eyes started to really open up. He actually had a wandering eye uh, uh, that was kind of interesting. He would, couldn't tell if he was really focusing on you. And, and, and then he, I remember he sat there and he said, you know what really worries me is that I don't want to approve building another Southeast Expressway. I'm thinking of all those people sitting on their, in their cars, waiting in congestion, tied up, I don't think we should do that. So I'm trying to convey that this really great governor had a very concrete down-to-earth sense and uh, despite or in, you know, building on a foundation of the various technical uh, analyses, he came through with his value system. And one of the things that I want to do is um, indicate what the values were that came out of the restudy. He had the major choice of this, about the Southwest ex Corridor, build the full expressway, a managed expressway, or the Southwest Corridor Park, later prize winner, of course. He decided early in phase one to reject the inner belt. Too many takings didn't serve a useful function, would have increased congestion had terrible urban impacts, killed Route 2 extension inside of Alewife. That was going to go in along the rail corridor, if you can believe it, to meet the inner belt. He rejected I-95 North and the Southwest Expressway, managed or not. He supported building Third Harbor Crossing directly to Logan Airport. If we had time, I'd tell you another story about what, how that came about. Uh, as a result of people in East Boston screaming, don't you come back to us with another alignment unless it doesn't touch one house or one business. Ooh, my staff, you know, our staff coming back said, these people, how could they possibly do that? You know, think of that, I mean, it's impossible. It's gotta come up by Jeffrey's Point or, 
or Maverick Square or one of, you know. It. And then somebody said, well, what if it came up on Logan Airport property? And there was this like silence. Huh. Hmm. We could take that seriously. Of course, Ed King is head of uh, Massport. Maybe there'll be a little opposition there. I mean, remember the political context for this. Ed King, in the end, opposed Mike Dukakis in the primary, became governor himself. I mean, these issues are fraught with politics, both good and bad. Um, he decided to, um, to uh, look at the feasibility of depressing the central artery, the idea of the depressing the artery. Um, I think I was the third person in the universe to hear about it. Fred uh, and Bill Reynolds came to my office at the BTPR and said, well, there's, you know, we can sort of see the handwriting on the wall and there's 14% unemployment in the construction industry and a billion dollars of highway aid uh, at risk here. Um, what about depressing the central artery? And, uh, you know, we jointly thank you, Fred, for bringing it there at that moment. And I'm glad we had a staff that we could say, yeah, well, let's take a look at the feasibility of this. So they did the first feasibility study, and the governor adopted the, the concept of studying it further. It was in his decision memo. Um, by 73, we extended uh, by almost a year to deal with the red line, and, and again, our community liaison staff, which should not be overlooked, 10% of our budget was devoted to technical assistance and community liaison to develop new ideas. One of the new ideas was, since the residents of Cambridge didn't want the red line to go from Porter directly to Alewife, it had been mired in controversy for years, Somebody said, well, there's an abandoned rail line from Davis Square out to Alewife. Um, what about, going? and Somerville said, well, we don't have any transit service. And that's how that happened. Literally, people came back from, we have just met with Cambridge, Somerville, and uh, you know Arlington, and maybe we could take the red line this way and then out. That's, that's why it goes where it goes. Um, he also, endorsed the idea of, um, of uh, circumferential transit uh, as something to be studied, uh, almost in the inner belt corridor. And he said, I'm going to go to Washington and try to change federal law and make gas tax, federal gas tax money available for transit. And he, um, uh, that became known as the Boston Provision. Alan Altschuler went down to uh, testify and to enlist support and suddenly found metropolitan areas all over the country wanted to do the same thing. And, you know, that was spring of 72 when the governor made his decision. The Highway Act of 1974 enacted the interstate transfer provision. Um, so there was a remarkable coming together and a change of federal law. That particular idea of tapping the, the uh, uh, gas tax changing the law had been developed in one of my students at the Harvard Law School program and by that time he was general counsel to Alan Altschuler who was by then the first secretary of transportation. So, you know, studies can have an impact uh, when uh, the timing is right. Um, let me show you the planning assumptions now uh, that are behind the new decisions, and uh, then we're just about through. I'm sure I'm going way over. But this is literally, we didn't have PowerPoint in those days. This is a photograph of one of the actual graphics that we use. This was really beautiful. Um, and uh, you can see the assumptions that greeted the governor and the BTPR were billed to meet projected demand. A rise in traffic demand is independent of highway supply and must be accommodated. Balanced transportation means building both modes. You remember the orange line picture? Uh, dislocation and environmental damage are necessary costs for the greater good. Over and over, we heard from some of the DPW people, well, you know, if you're going to make an omelet, you've got to break eggs. Hmm, very interesting. 
Um, land development, I mean, that was said to the governor's task force, you know? It's like healthcare and broccoli or something. It's some of these off the wall ideas. Land development patterns reflect natural demand which must be accommodated. Instead of that, the new planning assumptions, travel demand must be influenced by public policy, not accepted as an imperative. Constraint of highway supply is a determinant factor influencing travel demand. Constraint of highway supply. Land development patterns are influenced themselves by configuration of transportation supply. In Boston, the forces of decentralization are opposed. In Boston, concentration of activity fostered by mass transit is supported by community consensus misspelled. Um, Planning, further planning assumptions, the concept of balance rather than what you saw in that orange line southwest graphic includes housing supply, open space, air quality, neighborhood amenity, auto amenity. Public policy must determine the priority of automobility as one of many priorities. So to wrap up, a whole bunch of projects came out of the restudy. Some are listed there. I didn't mention that, oh, early in the restudy we were looking at all these transit plans and someone said, well, you know, the stations on the red line uh, only take four cars. How can you be planning an extension out there? So we spun off quickly the station modernization program that expanded all the stations to six uh, car ability. Um, and by the same token, the commuter rail plan, uh, facility was rusting and going to pot, and we spun that off as a commuter rail improvement program with its own advisory process, its own uh, technical people, its own state director, and you know, as a result, you see a viable commuter rail uh, network. So it's not just the big plans, but some of those really operational type issues, um, and. Um, the new planning process that was left from that is a multimodal planning staff for Boston, the creation of the central transportation planning staff accountable to the federally mandated metropolitan organization chaired by the Secretary of Transportation. I was privileged to be the first director of that staff reporting to Fred uh, as the successor transportation secretary. and. Um, municipal and private involvement and agency involvement through a joint regional transportation committee. Conclusions, Walt Hansen, who headed the consultant team, stood up with the Engineering Society in Washington at the conclusion of this and said, I've just been through the most amazing experience directing this program. And let me tell you about it. And let me say in conclusion, it had better alternatives, better criteria, and better decisions. I mean, that summed it up from an engineer and planner who had been directing this. Politics, to me, is an essential part of this. I think it's appropriate for major infrastructure projects to be properly in a really political decisions. An advisory process, I think, is stronger than anything that is a veto type pro uh, program process. The people have to speak on the merits, and the merits of an argument don't care whether you come from this agency or that uh, group or whatever. It has its own strength, and if taken seriously as it was here, it, it is uh, uh, really not to be missed. The steering group was key, as you've seen. Internal and external issues in every one of these organizations were key, and it leads to my belief that an alliance between insiders and outsiders can be a powerful way to create a change in public policy. Community liaison and technical assistance was key. Any kind of process like this that smacks of window dressing, don't try it. If you really are clear you're going to do one alternative and you're trying to pretty it up by saying, well, we're going to have an advisory process and look, it'll be seen through right away. The, there was no sense that giving the governor just a no-build option was viable. He had to build something. 
And key to that was the Southwest Carter Park, the development roads in that area. We needed to give the governor an option that said, yes, I too can build something and I can do it in a way that balances transportation, economic and, and environmental protection. The rules of the game can be changed. The gas tax can be changed. The state constitution can be changed. Leadership styles are key. We saw leadership from the governor. Um, and uh, changing projects, you know, in a way is easier than changing approaches. I will say in conclusion that, uh, oh, a few years after this was done, I wanted to talk to one of the engineers uh, who had been on the Interbelt staff, and I would call up the number, and you know what they would answer, Interbelt. <laughs> I said, hmm. <laughs> and uh, so I really appreciate this opportunity, and I'm sorry I went on at such length, but it was an opportunity to remind us all of some lessons that are so easily forgotten and that I think are worth remembering. Thank you. What a remarkable story. If any of you have not picked up Jack's outline um, that he was referring to, I really encourage you because it is well, it should become the framework for a chapter in a book on this whole period. It's, it's really a contribution to the history of this period. Uh, I want to welcome Mayor Davis, who's joined us back in the back there. Hi. Um, Suzanne Rasmussen. Suzanne is the director of the Environmental and Transportation Planning Division of the Cambridge Community Development Department. Now think about that for a second. That title by itself suggests we've come a ways, right? Um, she directs Cambridge's programs to reduce greenhouse gases, and she develops and implements Cambridge's transportation policies. I've gotten to know her pretty well because she is one of the principal uh, flag carriers for the Urban Ring Project, which is the legacy of what uh, Jack was talking about. In fact, it is, I think this is a true statement, it is the only one of the recommendations from BTPR that has yet to be implemented in any form. So all of you out there, let's keep up the good fight. Um, Suzanne. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Um, I have the uh, impossible task of covering 50 years of transportation planning history in 20 minutes, so uh, I'll get uh, right to it. Um, as as um, Jack illustrated, the highway planning era thought of Cambridge as uh, sort of a, a means to an end. This is uh, how we move regional traffic and it really doesn't have a whole lot to do with Cambridge and its own transportation needs. It's really how do you um, serve the bigger needs uh, of mobility as it was envisioned at the time. Um, this is uh, how Cambridge would be bisected by um, the inner belt and um, it uh, really cut cut it in half, basically. Um, here's a, a couple of uh, frightening images, and although also like amusing, it, it seems like almost impossible that uh, anyone could have imagined this when, when you look at it, but uh, the red dotted line uh, shows how the, the uh, Route 2 extension was going to come into Cambridge, and then the inner belt would come down um, through uh, what is today, um, and it was at the time Elm Street and Brookline Street across the river. Um, this beautiful image is uh, the big road in the sort of north-south in the picture is Mass Ave. And uh, you might be able to spot the, the fire station uh, down in your left-hand corner. There's a tower. That's the Lafayette Square fire station. And this is how the inner belt would cut across Cambridge. And uh, this uh, looks like Scheme Z, but it is actually um, uh, how uh, um, I-95 and um, 
695 would connect. Uh, in, um, uh, this is right at the BU Bridge where the, the inner belt was supposed to uh, cross the Charles River and connect to Memorial Drive and the many, many lines going is up uh, Brookline Street and Steve Miller's house is somewhere underneath uh, some of those lines. Um, and obviously there were both um, demolitions and buildings otherwise adversely impacted, meaning uh, uh, falling in the shadow of, of these um, elevated ramps. Um, this, I think, is an attempt to show how great the inner belt would be because um, the idea would be that it creates a buffer between uh, the, com the industrial part of the, the town and the residential. So the way planning was thought of at the time was uh, you have people living in neighborhoods and then on the, you have um, buffers and on the other side we have all the undesirable uses um, of uh, commerce that were um, uh, not able to uh, have in a city in a way that was really could coexist with uh, how people live. And again, this, this is Brookline Street. Uh, this is Brookline Street today. Um, it was just recently renovated. Um, uh, the part of the reconstruction uh, took away one side of nighttime parking and uh, that enabled the creation of a bicycle lane. And as you can see in the image, uh, the street is uh, a mixed use. Um, uh, area with uh, where some businesses uh, intermix with residents and a, a very significant focus on uh, not only uh, bicycling but also um, uh, pedestrian mobility with curb extensions and highly marked crosswalks. Uh, not, nothing like the image from before. Um, this is Elm Street, uh, obviously a very residential street, um, again with uh, traffic calming measures to slow traffic, bike bike parking facilities and um, beautiful tree-lined streets. Um, so clearly um, the, the uh, vision uh, from then is, uh, uh, is uh, no, nowhere in sight in, in today's streets. Uh, this is uh, Lafayette Square Park. I mentioned the Lafayette Square Fire Station. This is uh, an example of, of uh, road dieting where uh, what was uh, asphalt that was supposed to be uh, necessary for accommodating cars has been reclaimed and is now a, a, a very heavily used park that on its opening day um, had 200 people standing there celebrating the park opening. Uh, but let me just um, move through um, how planning in Cambridge, transportation planning in Cambridge has evolved uh, since the 60s. And, um, uh, I know many of you lived here, so this will be uh, old news to you, but uh, in the 60s, um, there was a flight to the suburbs. People didn't want to live in Cambridge. They wanted to have a middle-class lifestyle in the suburbs. And uh, industry also didn't want to be here anymore. Uh, all the old industries that uh, Cambridge's economy was based on started leaving, um, leaving Cambridge, leaving the region altogether. Uh, and examples of that are, is uh, Lever Brothers in Kendall Square and the Simplex Y and Cable um, plant in what is now known as University Park. Um, and this departure uh, created, uh, of industry creates these very uh, large areas of land uh, that either is cleared or has very old buildings on it and uh, was seen as uh, ripe for redevelopment. And also at the time, uh, Cambridge residents carried 70% of the burden of financing the city services. And I just note that today, that is 35%, uh, because the commercial uh, real estate taxes are so significant that the burden has really shifted um, a lot. Um, in the, in, during those times, uh, planners saw neighborhoods as uh, cramped and um, the streets were so narrow and it's not good because we're trying to accommodate the, the automobile, it's really impractical and the, the attitude was like we really need to have uh, urban renewal and just wipe this stuff out and, and uh, advance into the modern age. Um, in the 60s the city zoning code was revised and uh, um, to allow quite dramatic uh, building heights and um, uh, it, the focus was on buildings that can be accessed by cars, so uh, large surface parking facilities, campus-style commercial development, 
um, and um, again, very auto-oriented. And th this is a picture of Rinch, Taos, and Alewife, and that's an example of the kind of thinking, let's build very huge buildings and, and uh, surround them by a sea of surface parking lots. Um, and um, the, there were many, <coughs> many other uh, buildings that, that came about at the time of, of this nature. Uh, in the 70s, um, we're still talking uh, a depressed economy. Uh, planners were very busy trying to think of ways of revitalizing the economy, uh, preventing further flight, and, and securing the tax base. And um, around this period, uh, we're talking Cambridge has junk bond uh, uh, status as opposed to its current triple A bond rating. Uh, not a, a, a um, place that was seen by planners as very successful. Um, again, the sort of the urban renewal focus resulted in, in uh, wide streets. Uh, Kendall Square is uh, an example of that. When the Cambridge Redevelopment Authority was created in the 70s um, and the revitalization started taking place, the idea was that every street had to have multiple lanes in each direction and huge sweeping turns. Uh, there had to be a lot of parking uh, in the Alewife area, we're still dealing with uh, the um, uh, legacy of uh, two parking spaces per thousand square feet of commercial development, where today that's half that. And, and also there was this notion that, uh, again, you really had to separate things because the, the commercial development would create all this traffic and it had to be like over in its own area and the, the whole notion of mixed use was not at all uh, and thought about at the time. Now, all of this um, was not welcomed by everyone in Cambridge, um, and uh, the city started uh, receiving a, or being served a uh, succession of downzoning petitions. Uh, people were very unhappy with what was resulting from this kind of planning thinking, and um, a, a whole process started to sort of undo a lot of what had been created in the 60s in terms of um, the vision that was uh, embedded in the zoning code. Um, and also at the same time, there was pressure on more public involvement, and, and this is when the, the, rather than just being able to build whatever large building you could fit under the zoning code, you actually had to go uh, through a review process, and, and um, obviously that um, has expanded greatly since then, but this was the time when um, the, the um, pressure was felt and more public involvement uh, started to be required. Um, the, as we've heard from Jack, uh, the, uh, on the state level there was a, a lot going on at, at this time and um, finally in 1972 the, the Cambridge, uh, the inner belt and the the highway ex extension from Route 2 uh, into Cambridge was finally deleted from the state transportation plan. And I, I have myself had the opportunity to hear uh, audio excerpts from Frank Sargent, and I, I've been told that you haven't heard of any of them in, in the series, so I wanted to just play a quick one um, to uh, have everybody uh, hear how uh, incredible um, the, the um, uh, his vision was for the time, and I have my technical expert available right here. This is a special report, highway or mass transit, the governor decides. From the studios of WCBB-TV, here is the governor of the Commonwealth, Francis W. Sargent. I present to you tonight decisions touching the lives of all of us. The problems of transportation have held us prisoner for 40 years, and recently that captivity has become intolerable. You, your family, your neighbors have become caught in a system that's fouled our air, ravaged our cities, choked our economy, and frustrated every single one of us. To move ourselves, our goods, and our services, we built more and more and bigger and better superhighways and expressways. They seem the easiest, the most obvious answer to our multiplying needs. What we misunderstood was what those highways would create 
massive traffic congestion. We found that we had defeated our own purpose and that we had been caught in a vicious cycle. More cars meant more highways, which meant more traffic jams. More traffic jams meant the need for more highways, which meant more traffic jams and the need for superhighways. Shall we build more expressways through cities? Shall we forge new chains to shackle us to the mistakes of the past? No. We will not repeat history. We shall learn from it. We will not build the expressways. Instead, we will embark on a nearly $2 billion program blending the best interest of our state, not merely in transportation, but in our economy, and more important, in the quality of our lives from now to beyond the start of a new century. Um, we will have this audio put online if anyone would like to hear it again. Transportation became seen as an environmental issue. And it, it um, uh, started really with uh, uh, concerns about air quality and not meeting local air quality standards as a result of, of transportation impacts. And um, the city council adopted uh, the vehicle trip reduction ordinance. And, the title says all, um, and that um, ordinance is, is very broad ranging, but has had a very significant impact on um, how transportation planning has evolved because it is stated policy that transportation planning is about reducing uh, vehicle trips. Um, so for the last 20 years, that's really been the thinking. A number of other documents, and I won't go into the details of them uh, right now, but a very significant policy around uh, managing transportation demand, uh, uh, requiring mitigation, and recently, of course, a very strong focus on climate change and uh, reducing uh, climate change impacts that result from transportation. So the 90s was really the decade where um, uh, ideas uh, about having growth without uh, the, the traditional traffic impacts came into play. Uh, just very quickly, uh, this, the, this is the city's growth policy, um, and it talks about um, uh, uh, undertaking measures to uh, improve the, the street network, but not in increasing through capacity of traffic uh, and reducing uh, congestion and other negative impacts. Um, and also encouraging all reasonable forms of non-automotive travel. Um, and these, are, these become uh, uh, very important policies um, when we're talking about development and, and not just uh, having a, uh, the, the supposed demand influence the design of the street. It's really the other way around. Can this street accommodate the traffic that's being projected? And if it cannot, then the traffic needs to be reduced. Um, this is just a, an image of how in the 90s, uh, and this is just ex an example of, of how these policies translate into real, real projects on the street. Um, I don't, you probably remember this, although it's kind of easy to forget that uh, Mass Ave and Central Square used to have uh, six, six lanes of traffic, if you count five, parking. with parking. Um, uh, and uh, not very easy to cross the street, and the street was uh, not re reduced to two and three lanes of, of traffic um, and bike lanes and lots of pedestrian amenities. And there wasn't, it wasn't like uh, anyone was reducing the number of cars coming through here. It's just um, you have to move a little more slowly. So th this is a, a, a very clear example of how the thinking changed. So um, where has all this uh, gotten us today? And I'll say that, uh, as most people know, uh, Cambridge has added a very significant number of jobs and has become a, a regional, if not national, center for uh, biotechnology and <coughs> pharmaceutical industry. Um, and some neighborhoods have, have added a dramatic amount of square footage, whereas others, and notably the inner, where the inner belt was supposed to be, is very, very similar to um, uh, how it was uh, a long time ago. 
Um, but um, the policies that are in place have, have really uh, shown me measurable differences. Um, this is a, a resident parking permit chart over, uh, over time, and you can see um, there was a 10% decrease in permits issued between 2000 and 2009. Um, and I can, uh, it's, it's still, it still went down uh, until 11, and now it's kind of seems like maybe it's flattened a little bit, but um, this, it's definitely not going up. Um, also, 50% uh, of Cambridge households uh, that are, um, are located within a quarter mile of a T station do not have cars. Um, and the number of households without uh, cars uh, went from 28 to 32 percent between 2000 and 2008. So um, a lot of downward trend, the, the uh, residents driving to work is down, employees regardless of where they live is down in the uh, several decades in a row. So we're really seeing uh, downward trends. And um, this, this is kind of a remarkable um, slide. It's almost impossible to believe, but um, I've looked very closely at the data, and in the, the decade between 2000 and 2010, uh, almost 4 million square feet of development was added in Kendall Square, which was like a almost 40% increase in the square footage. And these are daily traffic volumes um, and on three different streets, and they all show uh, the same trend line, uh, that it's either holding steady or going down. So. Uh, and how is that even possible? Well, it's possible because uh, programs have been put in place that um, help employees come to work without bringing a car, or in some cases hinder them <laughs> in bringing their car because the charging for parking uh, has become um, uh, a norm. And so you can have this kind of growth uh, without the, the traffic impacts that uh, has been hoped for. Um, other measure, we, we see very clearly how other measures are growing. Bicycling has been exploding in terms of um, uh, its importance as a mode of transportation. This is, again, eight years and a 150% increase in the number of cyclists on the road. Um, and we're just about to launch the bike share program, which uh, I believe will make these numbers, I mean, they're going to continue anyway, but they're really going to continue. Uh, going up. Uh, bicycling is really becoming a mode where you can start thinking that 10% of trips to a center of employment could, be, could easily be made by bicycle. Um, also, uh, I was delighted to um, share that Cambridge twice in the last five years has been named by a national magazine as America's most walkable city. Um, and we have the absolute record uh, of any city in America in terms of the number of people who walk to work. Uh, it's a very viable mode in, in Cambridge. Um, this uh, it looks, I'm sure, like a confusing slide, but um, uh, one of the very unique things in Cambridge is that uh, any uh, non-residential facility that adds parking is required to put in place programs to um, reduce the number of people who um, drive to that site. So if you uh, build a, a, an office building and you build parking, um, you will be required to um, have 10% less auto traffic than would have been the case in 1990 in that same area. And that's something that the uh, um, city requires a comprehensive plan from, from each employer as to how they're going to achieve that. Um, every year they have to submit a report to document whether they're achieving it or not, and if they're not, they have to do more things. And, and this um, has had a very significant impact on um, the ability to grow without the traffic impacts. Uh, this is, a, a, I believe, a unique um, policy in Cambridge that uh, not only do you have to do these kinds of things, but we actually check it every year to see if you succeed or not. Um, and uh, Cambridge also requires any project over 50,000 square feet to do a very detailed traffic study and, and mitigate uh, traffic impacts um, that are demonstrated through the study. And I would note that um, that requirement came about uh, explicitly as a result of community uh, involvement. 
um, in the late 90s, early 2000s, there was a very uh, strong um, uh, anti-development sentiment in Cambridge. A lot of it was focused around transportation and um, uh, some very explicit proposals were put forward by residents in Cambridge as to how one could understand the traffic impacts of a project and seek to minimize them. And that became uh, law, that became zoning, and um, has a very, very direct impact on um, how to measure a project's impact and make sure that traffic impacts are mitigated. So I'd say it, it's perhaps a smaller example, but it's also a very powerful example uh, of how community involvement uh, can lead to something um, very substantial in terms of reducing development impacts. Um, and I just uh, wanted to finish up uh, talking about uh, the urban ring and um, uh, back in the day, uh, transportation planners, municipal planners were lobbying for projects like the inner belt and I can say that uh, the most important regional transportation uh, projects that the city is lobbying for and I have to say <laughs> has been lobbying for for 18 years, I think Dick and I have worked on the urban ring for 18 years by now. Um, uh, are the urban ring project and um, if you take a look at this slide you can see that um, the, the urban ring corridor as envisioned is uh, extremely close to the inner belt corridor um, and, and seeks to connect a very important uh, center, employment centers and residential neighborhoods uh, in the inner core that supposedly the uh, inner belt would have. Um, this project is absolutely essential for the continued growth um, of, of the inner core and, and as Dick said, uh, really needs to happen and really needs your help in terms of uh, pushing for because it's uh, a project that has not gotten traction or it has less traction now in the state planning uh, environment than it even used to have. Uh, and then of course the Green Line extension uh, and making sure that the <coughs> Charles River bridges as they're being rebuilt fully accommodate uh, bicyclists and pedestrians. Um, so it's really, um, uh, all the energy now goes into um, supporting these kinds of regional mobility projects that are non-auto non based. So quite, uh, quite a long um, way from uh, 50 years ago when Innabelt was on the table. And that's the end of my remarks. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, we're going to conclude with Anthony Flint. Um, he is a fellow and director of public affairs at the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy over on Brattle Street. Uh, he is the author of Wrestling with Moses, How Jane Jacobs Took on New York's Master Builder and Transformed the American City, in fall paperback version of This Land, The Battle Over Sprawl in the Future of America comes out. He's working on a book on Le Corbusier. Many of you might have gotten to know him originally as a journalist with The Globe. Um, he still has a journalist hat. He, uh, is a regular contributor to Atlantic Cities, which is the uh, online site of Atlantic Monthly. And I believe he recently delivered a TED Talk on infrastructure and urban neighborhoods. So let's welcome him. Well, I am uh, uh, honored to be here in such an esteemed company. I am in an unenviable position. I am standing between you and dinner, <laughs> the Bruins game, but for this crowd, most important, the question and discussion period. <laughs> so I'm going to make this quick. Um, what, I, what I hope to do is conclude this incredibly uh, resonant symposium with some brief remarks about the legacy of the Interbelt story, 
not only for the Boston metropolitan region, but uh, in a national context uh, in all those many years since uh, circa 1970. My goal being um, to consider implications for infrastructure, the public process, and regional planning right up to the present day. In terms of a roadmap, if you will, uh, I'd first like to place the interbelt battle in the larger context of the freeway revolts, then look at the present day uh, campaign to dismantle urban freeways, uh, those that were built, and then look at the present day, uh, uh, look at the importance of uh, greener infrastructure in a regional context, and some of the ways the legacy of this remarkable story has left us struggling still with so many challenges in terms of financing and process. Well, first let's have some fun and uh, consider the woman who was a big inspiration, arguably, for what happened here and across the country, Jane Jacobs, the housewife from Scranton who settled in Greenwich Village and confronted this plan uh, by Robert Moses to extend Fifth Avenue through Washington Square Park. <laughs> I hadn't quite gotten to that Supreme Court decision uh, at this time. This was in the uh, 1950s. It was intended to connect with the Southeast uh, uh, Washington Square Southeast development and ultimately to the Lower Manhattan Expressway. Jane, like all of uh, Greenwich Village, cherished this 10-acre park and brought her kids there. The first lesson being, uh, don't mess with a mother and her stroller. Um, Jane's tactics in fighting the Washington Square Park roadway plan were thorough and effective, including this photo op featuring her daughter Mary. This is a ribbon tying ceremony, uh, as opposed to a ribbon cutting ceremony that politicians love so much. Uh, remembering this is in the late 50s, and of course, this roadway was never built. Um, one of the first defeats for Robert Moses, who was Parks Commissioner at the time, in addition to being about a dozen other things in New York City. Uh, next, of course, is what I uh, might argue is, a, is a big, another big inspiration, concurrent uh, with the freeway revolts, including the inner belt battle, uh, and that was uh, Moses' Lower Manhattan Expressway. One of three crosstown expressways that he proposed, uh, the others were the Mid-Manhattan Expressway, another expressway at 125th Street, and of course the one that was executed, the Cross Bronx Expressway. It's amazing to think, uh, really, that a 10-lane elevated expressway could be roaring down Broom Street in Soho, uh, but uh, the, some, some of the most uh, incredible and valuable uh, urban real estate in, in the world. Um, with its lofts and cast iron buildings. But that was the plan, to re relieve congestion and connect uh, the uh, Holland Tunnel with the, um, uh, with the East River bridges. Uh, to fight this battle, Jane helped rally public support, teamed up with a soft-spoken minister whose chapel was in the path of the uh, expressway, politicians from the left and the right, and even some interesting characters from Little Italy, if you know what I mean. Um, all the while, she enticed reporters to really think about whether it was such a good idea to uh, blast highways through urban neighborhoods that were functioning in places of jobs and housing, and she was one of the first to really talk about what we now know as uh, induced demand, uh, the uh, notion that's been discussed of uh, building more lanes and then just typically seeing them fill right up. Again, this audacity to speak up, I like to think of her as Rachel Carson and Aaron Brockovich all rolled into one, landed her in trouble specifically in the back of a squad car in the spring of 1968, arrested for inciting a riot at one particularly raucous public hearing on the Lower Manhattan Expressway. This is where she and others ripped up the stenotype record of the hearing and threw it into the air like confetti. <laughs> well, many of these same uh, tactics and, uh, and uh, a groundswell of organized public opposition to Moses-style urban freeway plans were seen in freeway revolts from Baltimore to San Francisco and, of course, right here in Boston. The passion of this cause was coupled with a surge of activism in environmental law and a continuing backlash against the policies of urban renewal. The Cross Bronx Expressway, of course, and many others were built, but from those days going forward, as we all know, mega projects would never again be executed without public participation. That public process endures to this day, but this is where the legacy of the inner belt and similar battles begins to get complex. 
This part of the story uh, begins with what uh, just about everybody, uh, I think, can agree is good news and a good idea, and that is dismantling the urban freeways that were built. Uh, Portland arguably led the way with Tom McCall's audacious plan to remove Harbor Drive and replace it with a waterfront park. Under John Norquist, Milwaukee tore down the Park East Expressway. San Francisco famously replaced the stub end of the elevated Embarcadero, damaged in the 1989 earthquake, with a multi-purpose urban boulevard that has been so successful there today. New Orleans is moving ahead with a plan to similarly transform the Claiborne Expressway. The Sheridan Expressway in New York is coming down, is set to come down, and Seattle, pictured here, has gone through many years of dialogue and controversy to replace the Alaskan Way Viaduct with a waterfront boulevard. Oh, and a short distance from here, a certain $15 billion project suppressed an interstate highway and produced some 30 acres of public space. As former Denver planning director Peter Park said recently as part of a campaign, as part of a uh, spring lecture series at the Lincoln Institute, there's, there's a burgeoning national campaign for freeway removal, based in large part on the assertion that the replacement boulevards create value and revitalize downtowns. Where it gets interesting, I think, is, uh, what, is in what might be called the second generation of urban freeway transformations, the son of the big dig, if you will. Uh, and uh, uh, Boston is once again at the forefront, wrestling with aging infrastructure, the McGrath and O'Brien Highway, the Rutherford Avenue connector, and the Casey Overpass. The public process that the inner belt and freeway revolts left us means that all stakeholders are equally heard and these projects are often greeted with similar skepticism. For adjacent, adjacent neighbors, there's the view that these roadways actually work pretty well just as they are, uh, keeping regional commuter traffic off city streets, for example. The related experience of Mass Pike air rights has revealed similar concerns about congestion and density and infill redevelopment. All of this, uh, I think, raises questions about whether some 40 years later, uh, we really do have an adequate framework uh, for making regional decisions. And so here I, I go back briefly to Robert Moses, the swaggering power broker who Jane Jacobs took on, who single-handedly built the New York we know today. It's bridges and byways, parks and swimming pools, Jones Beach, the UN building, Shea Stadium, and of course uh, thousands of homes and towers. This is not to suggest a return to Moses, but rather a recognition of the regional vision that resulted in all this infrastructure, and whether it can be applied to the green infrastructure needs of today, and critically, how to pay for it. Uh, nor do I mean more bridges to nowhere or sprawl enabling highways, but primarily transit infrastructure that recognizes the importance of cities and metro metropolitan regions in the post-carbon era. The Second Avenue subway in Manhattan was supposed to be accompanied by the Arc Tunnel access to the region's core under the Hudson River, uh, but that was derailed uh, famously by New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, uh, who it was revealed in a recent New York Times story by my uh, former Globe colleague, uh, Kate Zernike, uh, in the end uh, cited some uh, debatable assertions about cost. Tea Party activists have been shutting down public meetings across the country interestingly, using the very same tactics pioneered by Jane Jacobs in opposition to public works, uh, regional planning, and smart growth. California's ambitious high-speed rail project is opposed by the residents of Palo Alto, among other places, who say to that proposed corridor, not in my backyard. So how can uh, urban infrastructure be properly framed for the 21st century city? Our own John Kerry, as well as uh, uh, former Pennsylvania Governor Ed Rendell and New York Mayor Michael Bloomberg, have joined in an effort to explore financing mechanisms like an increase in the gas tax or an infrastructure bank or value capture where the uh, public investment in infrastructure is uh, recaptured um, for the uh, value it creates. Um, uh, and they're supported by groups like America 2050 uh, and Building America's Future and Transportation for America. Now, the reauthorization of the federal transportation spending uh, would uh, note I'm, I, I'm not calling it the highway bill. 
uh, would seem to be an appropriate forum for mapping out investments in key infrastructure. Uh, the uh, U.S. Department of Transportation, in a remarkable break from the past, has already said its transport programs will be oriented around livability. Budgets for transit will double, including addressing an $80 billion backlog of work in transit systems in our cities. Reauthorization could also be oriented around the fundamentally conservative idea of fix it first, um, which uh, was instituted uh, by Mitt Romney and Doug Foy right here in Massachusetts, uh, which is good news for urban infrastructure in cities because that's where the infrastructure uh, exists that would be kept in a state of good repair. So all those things could happen, but this bill is constitutionally incapable of moving forward in the current political climate, and uh, even another extension seems unlikely this year. Our cities also have something else to plan for, adaptation to the inevitable impacts of climate change, storm surge, severe weather, flooding, and sea level rise. Infrastructure must be appropriately located and relocated. Boston has moved ahead with guidelines for new development that takes this into account, and uh, former Arizona Governor Bruce Babbitt has called for a national plan based on the interstate highway system model, so metropolitan regions are encouraged to plan for this volatile future. Well, all of this suggests that there's a lot of hard work ahead. Um, if there is uh, skepticism leading to paralysis, it might only be overcome by better communication by planners. Uh, I do not mean to suggest that it's a simple matter of convincing the citizenry that we really know what we're doing this time, but I'd like to suggest a hybrid of these two extraordinary figures from the 20th century for a better dialogue and process that can reconcile the local and the regional, among other things. Jane Jacobs gave us the owner's manual for the livable city, and as in the inner belt battle, showed us the folly of urban freeways. But Robert Moses had a vision for regional planning and infrastructure. Going forward, our cities, I like to say, might need a little bit of both. Thank you. Again, great. Let's have a round of applause for all of the And we do, in fact, have some time for some questions. Um, for the purposes of the TV recording, I'm going to repeat the question. But first, I'm going to issue a challenge to you all. Who can phrase the most concise question? <laughs> So, do we have some hands? Um, this is a tiny detail about this thing square where I live. Um, and our house was right where the Grand Dollar Rock is to speak on. It's a paste in the square and the surrounding houses down on Brookline at one side, paste in the square, chestnut corner, is on the National Register of Historic Places. And I've often wondered if anyone knows if that was put on the National So was Hastings Square a uh, pawn in the game to d defeat the highway? Um, anybody have that one? I saw Charlie Sullivan here earlier. Is he still? <laughs> so I apologize. I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I suspect that Charlie Sullivan, who's the head of the Cambridge Historical Commission, might. And I, I'm, I would be glad to look into it for you. It, it was a common tactic in uh, the Lower Manhattan Expressway. Uh, the activists, uh, among other things, were racing to designate those cast iron buildings, uh, mm -hmm. cast iron facade buildings and others, uh, department stores, the palaces of trade for historic designation to stand in the way of the, of the Lomex corridor. And I think we need to say in the presence of the Cambridge Historical Society that historic preservation you know, is, uh, stands on its own merits, not just as a um, tool in the battle against something. All right, Steve? Uh, in, in the absence of Charlie Sullivan, I'm Bill King, the chair of the commission, um, and my understanding of the National Register process is that it largely post-dates the 
debated the battle on the inner belt. Uh, I think it was in the 70s more than in the 60s that the omnibus uh, nomination to the National Register was requested by the National Historical Commission and uh, submitted by Cambridge in yeah. response to that. Thank you. Steve. Um, I've listened to uh, all 10 speakers in this series and have some very good ideas here, but it seems like the essence of the Interbell experience somehow missed by all 10. And the way I put it is somebody should have shouted from the rooftops, my God, the citizens won. And indeed they did. They had to fight their local government, they had to fight their state government, they had to fight their federal government, and they won. I think that's a very important issue, and I hope that one of the panelists can uh, discuss that issue. I won't repeat that because it wasn't a question. But uh, maybe somebody wants to pick up on it. Well, you, you can hear from my presentation that my pitch on that issue is that um, the combination of the insiders and the outsiders was what it took in this particular set of huge issues. Whether citizens could have done it alone, I don't know. It depends on what they were, you know, their techniques and their their mission if they were trying to influence um, people in, a, in official position, which they were doing, um, they were being strategic about it. So my own sense is that strategy is very important in order to uh, attain success. Remember Jack's first slide with the governor's inauguration, the people winning. I, I would just add the example that I cited earlier that Cambridge um, development projects are now required to undergo very rigorous traffic studies, uh, have their impacts measured against some very clear standards, and if those standards are exceeded, have to mitigate impacts. That all came from citizens, um, uh, and very, very little was added by planners. So, so it's just another example uh, right here of uh, times when um, citizens certainly have some very direct and long-lasting and important impact. And I think it's also uh, important to note that Mike Dukakis, when he became governor, um, brought his own values. We heard Frank Sargent's values to some extent in the uh, portion of the broadcast. And, you know, those two leaders made a huge difference. So. Um, uh, Mike once said to me, you know, I didn't need a restudy to make a decision not to build the Southwest Expressway, but the, other, the new alternatives that came about as part of the restudy were extremely valuable. But he didn't need the whole process to um, uh, have his values come forth and, and uh, really to be in alliance with the citizens. So, you know, in mediation we say don't be too either or, and you can hear that that's my philosophy of uh, this kind of a process. It's not just the citizens, it's not just the officials, um, but it's a combination in, uh, used in a very uh, wise, strategic, tactical way. John? This isn't, isn't a question. Uh, <laughs> I moved from um, Cambridge to Jamaica Plain in 66. We started opposing in 66 what was then an elevated highway. And the, the slide that you showed was a depressed highway, which was a pr pr proposal that was made later. Interesting thing about that was people in, in Jamaica Plain, who it was probably would not have been taken, were objecting strongly to the elevated road for visual reasons, because it would physically and visually divide the neighborhood in half, even though there was an existing railroad embankment, the road would have been much wider and a few feet higher. Um, Jamaica Plain and Roxbury and the South End owe uh, a great deal to Cambridge because it was the opposition here that in fact produced uh, the, the people and will to oppose the, the Southwest Expressway. But I think most of us in Jamaica Plain um, did not see 
Governor Sargent as a um, as a helpful politician. We saw him in the end as not a leader but a, fo a, a follower, somebody who uh, <coughs> gracefully uh, acquiesced to the inevitability of the, of the road not being built. That the parliamentary decisions and the growing opposition made it clear that the road wouldn't be built. And we strongly objected to the, 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 the moratorium, and thank you, Mr. Walton, for your, your timeline. It reminds me of sequences and dates I've forgotten. The moratorium came, I think, 69. The state kept acquiring and raising properties uh, long after that, I think up until 71, maybe 72. It was, uh, th those people did not win. There were fires at night. They literally walked away from their little houses. The Boston Redevelopment Authority was supposed to provide relocation services. They simply came out and read the newspaper classifieds to people. Most people got little for their properties, certainly not what it would cost to, to replace them. And we learned how, in a way, stupid planners could be because they, don't learn, they didn't understand then that a neighborhood is a connection. And those neighborhoods were uh, destroyed. Um, the people were scattered. There were a lot of banks broken. Uh, we got nothing from Kevin White, nothing from Barney Frank, who was manager of the J.P. Little City Hall. And we felt we got very little from Governor Sargent. If I can rephrase John's question, <laughs> it is, was Governor Sargent simply taking the easy way out in the face of the inevitability of defeat of the highways. Thank you, Dick. <laughs> Anybody? Well, um, that's not my experience, but that doesn't in any way question your experience of him. Um, you know, there were fierce internal debates over this, so, um, uh, and the uh, Al Kramer contingent really won on the merits of putting forth the value system that you heard the governor ultimately speak about. Um, whether he, without the citizen pressure, would he have gone in that direction? Probably no. So I think it's an absolutely essential ingredient. When the restudy began, I believe the statistic was that 90% of the takings had already been made for the Southwest Expressway. So he was confronting, you know, what the engineers at the time hoped would be a fait accompli. It's too late to stop this, um, and therefore the coming up with the alternative of the Southwest Corridor Park and the development roads was absolutely key to giving him something that he could say yes to. So. Um, I'm more mixed on, and, and a fan of the governor, but also a fan of, of uh, Dukakis, who said he didn't really need a big restudy to reach the same essential conclusions. There's nobody that's even in, in the running for the concision prize so far. <laughs> Fred, I see you. <laughs> I'll just another question. But, uh, I understand that the unaccustomed position of saying good things about Republicans. I, I'm not sure people can can no. hear in the back. Could you? I'm accustomed to saying good things about Republicans. Uh, I think Frank Sargent was incredibly gutsy to make the decision that he made. And as somebody very close to Mike Dukakis and a guy that I obviously respect and, and, and love, Mike's position always was, I didn't need a restudy, I knew the answer, what did we waste our time for? Years later, he said to me, it's the hardest thing to do in politics, to say I was wrong and change your mind, and Frank Sargent did that, and it's incredibly important that he did. And when he made the decision, I'm, uh, and Jack was a great job of, of tapping up, points. When Sargent said, I'm going to change the federal law, he essentially jumped off the top of the Prudential building and Alan Alshua had to leave a safety net by the time he got to the ground floor. The interstate transfer was not a law. 
he was saying, I can get the money and do something else with it. The law had to be changed. The institutional change, you know, there are often fights and a lot of noise and everybody feels good and some people feel bad. And then afterwards, nothing has changed. The aftermath of the VTPI, the implementation that Jack and Alan and I see my friend Bob Curry here, uh, who was, as Jack pointed out at the first session, the architect of the state transfer strategy, that implementation was incredible. They not only got the ability to spend an equal amount of federal money for transit as would have been available for, uh, for the autos, they restructured the MBTA as an institution. They financed the MBTA. We're having a crisis now because we haven't seen the leadership since we restructured the finance of it. We had a pretty good structure that Sergeant gave us the Dukakis elaborated on it that screwed up in the year 2000. And we've just been through months and months of threats to our public transportation, and it still isn't fixed. Sergeant stepped up to the plate for the state to take half the cost of the uh, of transit subsidy. He got that legislation through, and Alan did it for him, but Sergeant made the tough decision. So the, the, uh, if we had just stopped the roads, and I say we because I started out as a citizen activist and eventually became the city's point person on this, we started up just, we would have been satisfied to stop the roads. But had we not, had you not changed the law so that the money could be built as transit, we wouldn't have won. The road would have come back. And the aftermath of the VTR, when the Sargent administration really demonstrated that they could get the money to build transit instead of the road, uh, when they actually began the process of doing it, when they changed the financing of the MBTA so that it could yeah. provide more service, that delivered in a way that made it hard to erase. The other thing that I think has to be said, it's very sad, Frank Sargent, and I didn't vote for Sargent, I voted for Mike, I voted for Mike Dukakis, but Sargent lost the election after he made this courageous decision. Dan Hayes, the mayor who led the initial opposition to the new belt, lost his election. So it takes a lot of guts to be a leader. You don't always get rewarded at the polls. Uh, but I think Sargent really deserves enormous credit for what he, for having the guts to make that decision, I believe it was a principal personal decision as Jack describes it. You could easily have made the case, uh, which I was making at the time, you can't build the roads because of Section 4F and, and, and other things, so you should go for transit. There's a pragmatic argument to do that. There was an equally strong pragmatic argument. You will never get Governor Volpe to agree to interstate transfer. You will never get the Congress to agree with that. The, the, he was in a very tough spot. It took huge guts to do what he did. And because he did those things, we got the red line. We got the Southwest Carter location. Those things would not have happened except for Frank Sargent's current at, at, at that point. So yeah, I, I don't usually say good things about Republicans, but this Republican is different. <laughs> And I would say Frank Sargent picked someone like Alan Altshuler uh, that made a huge difference. And Alan Altshuler picked someone like Bob Curry, who is here actually in the audience, which I hadn't known. Uh, Bob and I worked together when he was a student at Harvard Law School and uh, came up with this issue of, well, maybe we could, uh, you know, break open the Highway Trust Fund. And it was really your analysis that um, was then relied upon and used as a foundation, you by then were general counsel of EOTC. And uh, you know, being at the right place at the right time with the right idea and a, a leader who's receptive to it and who sees the political viability of having a fight on that issue uh, in the face of what he described, the governor described as the price of Hamburg, which uh, you know did him in because inflation and, and all were, were running rampant. But um, I think it's not just the leader, but it's the whole team that really to pull together to make this happen. 
Do people want to spend another 10 minutes? We're just at time, but would people like to spend another 10 minutes with questions? Yeah. That sounded like a yes. yes. Sure. What, I think what made the consensus in the process Jack described uh, the BTPR possible? Well, you know, I think the consensus reflected the mission. The mission was to develop a range of alternatives for choice by the governor. And therefore, everybody around the table had a stake in making sure that their pet ideas, pet project, big highway, transit extension, were adequately reflected. And what I found in that room was an increasing respect for each other. And people were able to speak in a way that said, well, you know, this is my interest, but I hear that that's your interest, and maybe we should do both of these things. So. I mean, they worked hard at it, I worked hard at it, obviously, and it's not you know, surprising that I've ended up as a mediator and facilitator for uh, over 25 years now. How but about sending Jack to Congress right It was a baptism now. of <laughs> professional um, realization that if you give people, uh, if you put them in a safe place where they have a a task to do where they can uh, listen to each other and, and begin with the realization that we're not just choosing among old things, we're trying to create something new. I think you, you're way ahead and I think that the, the steering group had a sense that they were creating something new both in process and in choices and ultimately in outcome. So I think it's a reflection. They all work together, but without that group, I think it could have been very different. Let's take one more, and then uh, Mayor Davis would like to uh, reflect a little on what we've done here. Back in the back. I just want to throw one more name into this pot, since we've put so much emphasis now on interstate transit. And I would like to ask Mayor Davis Thank you. Mayor? He was an extraordinarily important element for many, many. <laughs> watch, watch this space. It's Tip O'Neill's 100th birthday year, and there are going to be a number of activities uh, commemorating Tip O'Neill's birthday. Uh, I rise to speak really, uh, I think, on all your behalf to thank the wonderful Cambridge Historical Society for this series, which has been utterly remarkable. Fortunately, I found the script here. We should thank the planning committee, Carolyn Crockett, Dick Garver, Michael Kenny, Gavin Cleesbees, Alyssa Pacey, and Jim Peters for their thoughtful preparation of these three panels, which really have opened my eyes, and I'm sure the eyes of many of us, uh, to just how much change can come from the concerted action of citizens and the very professional action of planners who really take their community to heart. And I just want to thank them all. I want to thank all the people on the panel, but I also want to thank especially the Cambridge Historical Society. Please support this important Cambridge institution. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Uh, and just as one final thing, we have gifts for our speakers, which hopefully one of them will open, because there's a, a little bit of a humorous piece to it. Uh -huh. Maybe it's the Blanding's turtle, which was one of the endangered species <laughs> in the Southwest Carter Park. I used to keep a colored picture of the Blanding's turtle on my desk after our <laughs> ecologist discovered it. <laughs> 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 <laughs>